Hello, Asheville. We are interrupting our regular programming to bring you round one for WPVM of the Republican candidates for District 11. We've got Wendy Navarez here, Bruce O'Connell, Michelle Woodhouse, and Rod Honeycutt. And Judge Robert Orr, distinguished Judge Robert Orr, is our moderator. We'll have uh, up to three minutes to make a closing statement. And uh, we are packed in here into the studio in downtown Asheville. Uh, so if you hear any, any clattering or, or things falling, you'll just know we're, uh, we're enjoying the moment. So uh, we're going to begin with Wendy Navarez for her one-minute statement. Hello, my name is Wendy Marie Limbaugh Navarez, running for the Republican nomination for the primary that will happen on May 17th. I would love to earn your vote. Um, just a little bit about me. I was active duty for a decade in the United States Navy. I then went on to use my GI Bill to get an undergraduate degree in political science at the University of North Carolina at Asheville. And I went on to get my master's degree from Western Carolina University. I have served as a paralegal as well as uh, worked for the Social Security Administration. And I also serve as a substitute teacher, coach, and uh, Girl Scout leader here in the community. Thank you. That was Wendy Navarez. Next, Bruce O'Connell. Hello, Asheville. Thanks for having me here. My name is Bruce O'Connell. I've lived here 42 years. I run the Pisgah Inn up on the Blue Ridge Parkway. I'm running for Congress because I think we need to go back to what the Founding Fathers originally intended, and that is servant leadership. I've pledged not to take a salary. I've pledged to term limit myself. I'm not going for a political career, fame, or fortune. I'm going to give back to this district and try to change the direction of this country because I'm fed up with where we are right now. My name is Bruce O'Connell, and I would ask for you to go to my website, bruceoconnell.com, see what I'm all about, and I would appreciate your support. Bruce O'Connell. Next, Michelle Woodhouse. My name is Michelle Woodhouse, and I am not a politician. I am a patriot that was asked to step into this race. Uh, I'd served formerly as the GOP district chair here in the 11th Congressional District. I'm a small business owner who lives in Hendersonville, and the reason I stepped into this race was we need to have a member of Congress serving the people of Western North Carolina that's going to do the work, stay true to the Constitution, and absolutely be focused on serving all 700,000 plus of us that live here. No one who's going to abandon the district, but someone who truly understands the needs of Western North Carolina. My family's roots run over 200 years deep in Macon and Jackson County. And I would be honored to receive your vote in the May primary and then in November when we face a very difficult race uh, here in the 11th Congressional District. You can visit our website at woodhouse4nc.com. Excited to be here and look forward to the conversation today. All right. That was Michelle Woodhouse. And <clears throat> next, Colonel Rod Honeycutt. Hey, Judge, thank you very much. Judge, thank you very much. Devine, thank you. Matt, thank you for hosting this. Hey, Ash, my name is Rod Honeycutt. Born and raised here in western North Carolina down in a metropolis called Woodfin. For those of you know where Dog Holler's at, that's their home. So uh, left for uh, the Army in 1984, served 37 years, multiple combat tours around the world. Uh, career culminated with advising Congress on national defense, national security, and foreign policy. Uh, got to meet the uh, House Armed Service Committee, the Foreign Policy Committee, the Finance Committee, and uh, gives them advice on where to spend our national treasures, and we go into this with a lot of experience and not as a rookie in front of Congress. And we take uh, that as a, a feather in our cap as we go forward. The um, most important thing I want you to take out of this, I am a Western North Carolina first candidate. There's 15 counties here. I've done over 300 stops over the last seven months, talking to families, farmers, first responders, finding out what's on their mind. And when I go to Congress, I will represent everyone from Western North Carolina. Again, my name is Rod Honeycutt. You can visit our website at cutforcongress.com or call us at 828-275-6848. You call, we'll come visit. God bless you and yours. All right. Thank you, Rod Honeycutt. And let me just say before we get into the questioning that all eight candidates were extended an invitation uh, with an opportunity to appear. Four chose not to participate for whatever reason, but uh, we're delighted that the four of you uh, made the commitment to talk to the uh, the listeners today. 
So let's begin with the first question uh, for Wendy Navarez, and it's a Second Amendment question. The Heller case, uh, a decision by the United States Supreme Court written by Justice Scalia, uh, states uh, in essence that the reasonable regulation of firearms is a permissible limitation on the Second Amendment. So the question is, do you agree or disagree with this uh, concept of a limitation uh, on Second Amendment rights, and how would you personally define or explain reasonable regulation of firearms? So what I, sorry about that. All right, <laughs> got to get the mic here. So as far as regulations go, uh, that's a slippery slope. Um, I know that there are groups that will try to use fear to um, persuade people into believing or thinking or voting a certain way that, you know, their guns will be taking, taken from them. I think regulation is well-intentioned, but, again, can be a slippery slope. Uh, currently, there's already regulation that exists. Um, it's kind of baked into different parts of our um, society, and it tries to keep people with mental illness or violent backgrounds um, from getting firearms. And, of course, that's the legal means. The, the issue we have is that, um, you know, bad people are typically not going through legal processes to get the firearms that they have. So um, I believe that some regulation is important to obviously try to prevent um, those folks with, with issues from getting them. But um, in general, the Second Amendment stands, stands on its own, and, and um, I fully support it. All right. Uh, Bruce O'Connell, you're next. Yeah. Well, first of all, I do agree with reasonable regulation of firearms. But when I read about the Heller case, and I read Scalia's ruling, he stated that the Second Amendment protects an individual's right to possess a firearm unconnected with a service militia and to use that arm for lawful purposes, such as self-defense within the home. I believe there are already measures in place for regulating handguns. Those measures, in my opinion, are adequate. We have background checks. We have cooling off periods. We have prohibitions on felons and those with mental illnesses. And that is really the only prohibition we need if those are enforced. Now, let me say, as far as what should be legal and not legal to own, certainly I believe weapons of mass destruction, for example, bioweapons, chemical weapons, or nuclear weapons, no one should be able to own those. Those are military-style weapons. But all other weapons, for me, are okay, as long as they're owned lawfully. So, to answer your question, I do agree with reasonable regulation, but I believe they're already in place if they're enforced. That's Bruce O'Connell. Next, Michelle Woodhouse. Yeah, I, I think we're all in agreement. We all, all uh, that are sitting in here and in this race hold firmly to the Second Amendment. Um, the federal government should not be in the business of regulating who has a gun. I think we're all in agreement with his ruling and, and the, or his opinion on the ruling. We don't want the average citizen driving down Patton Avenue in a tank. Um, so we think we have we have regulations in place, um, but you know what we have to do is make sure that the far left doesn't start doing to the Second Amendment what they did to the Tenth Amendment, and we do start opening up conversations when we um, want to enforce further regulation or bring a case into into call. So I believe that the Second Amendment, as it stands right now, is exactly where it needs to be, and um, the the. We have to limit the power of the federal government as as it is specifically outlined in the Constitution. All right, that was Michelle Woodhouse. Finally, uh, Rod Honeycutt. Yes, sir. So, agree with the candidates, but to me, that's a reactive response versus a proactive response. And throughout the campaign, I've been advocating for firearm resiliency education experience where we bring federal dollars back to the district and we train our citizens on scenarios. We train our young men, men and women in high school on how to use firearms. So let's take it beyond the eliminate and let's go to educate. You know, recently we've had a couple of discharges of weapons here in the district where it's resulted in young men and women, young children losing their lives. Let's educate our citizens versus eliminate our citizens. That's the stance I'm going into it with. All right, thank you. I, I confess, and this isn't part of the format, having been an appellate judge for 18 years, my 
my indication is I, I need to do follow-up questions <laughs> for each of you, but that's not part of the format, so I will not do that. Um, I have but rebuttal for that. Yes, well, that's right. <laughs> Wendy Navarre is on rebuttal. Yeah. Yes, as far as, uh, you know, taxpayers' dollars at the federal level coming back for education on firearms, I believe that that should be uh, limited to a parent's responsibility. Um, I don't believe the federal government should get in the business of teaching more than math and reading and trying to get our kids ready for um, for our economy, our society. Um, I think they need to t get back to teaching civics. So I don't, I don't think that we should funnel money back just to teach people about firearms. That's a family's responsibility as I teach my children. And if a family doesn't want to teach their children that, they shouldn't have to. Bruce O'Connell, rebuttal. Well, I think I heard Wendy say that the role of the government should be to strictly teach reading, writing, and math. Mm -hmm. I don't believe the federal government, no offense, Wendy, should have anything to do with educating our kids at all. I want the federal government out of my kids' school, and I want to bring it home to my local school board. And I believe the federal government and the Department of Education has screwed things up, and they need to be abolished. All right. Michelle Woodhouse. It was exactly to my point about we start having this conversation and we're back to the Tenth Amendment and extending the powers of the federal government. I completely agree with uh, the comment made earlier. I don't want the federal government in our schools teaching our children about firearms. I grew up in a uh, a very strong Second Amendment home. My father's a veteran, a former police officer. We had uh, multiple guns in our home, and I was taught to respect them. I was taught how to shoot, when to shoot, what to do. And it's been a tragedy here in the district. We've seen it across this country where uh, small children get access to a handgun or some firearm that isn't properly being stored and managed within the home. And that's not the role of the federal government. Um, what we, we are the party of, of um, smaller government. I, I don't want the federal government expanding their powers or authorities into my home at all. I want them out of my bedroom, out of my medical files, and for sure out of my gun cabinet. All right, Michelle Woodhouse, next, Rod Honeycutt. I think that's very clear. I did not use the term school anywhere in my <laughs> sentence. So just to make sure we're tracking there. Uh, we have scouts. We have 4-H clubs. We have police departments. We have fire departments. Places that traditionally, and I was growing up here in Western North Carolina, we went and got firearms education. Now, my parents did a great job. My dad gave me a 1973 Western Auto that shot 18 rounds in it, just like the AR we're doing today. But if you ask the average citizen, they'll tell you that the AR is an automatic weapon. Let's educate citizens and not eliminate our Second Amendment. All right. Thank you. Uh, and I am going to do this just for clarification on, on our Second Amendment uh, issues here. Uh, and that is, do you support background checks for purchasing at least certain firearms? Just a, just a yes or no, Wendy? Yes. 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 Well, great. That was an easy question. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. So let's move on to the second uh, controversial topic here. And this goes first to Bruce O'Connell. Uh, and this is a question about the Roe v. Wade decision, which is currently under review uh, at the U.S. Supreme Court um, as, as we talk today. Uh, the decision by the U.S. Supreme Court in Roe v. Wade was premised on an unstated constitutional right to privacy. And so my question is, uh, do you feel that Roe v. Wade should be reversed or substantially modified? And if so, do you believe that the unstated constitutional right to privacy should be maintained or eliminated by the Supreme Court in its current review? Okay, first of all, I'm 100% pro-life. Let's get that out of the way. Secondly, I believe in the Supreme Court and I'll abide by its rulings. That's the law. I also am a believer in states' rights. Now, the basis of Roe versus Wade, as we've read it, was based on the concept of privacy, that a woman has privacy with her own body. I really think that that privacy is already addressed in the Constitution, even though it's not explicit, it's implicitly addressed. For example, freedom from unreasonable search and seizure. That addresses privacy. Privacy is addressed in the Constitution. 
I personally believe that Roe versus Wade is less about privacy and more about the question of when life begins. That's the argument. Does life begin at inception? Does it be at conception, excuse me. Yeah. Does it begin when there's a heartbeat? Or does it begin eight weeks, 12 weeks, 36 weeks, or after birth? That's the question. And I believe that life begins at conception. Therefore, the idea of Roe versus Wade being overturned, I'm in favor of, but not on the basis of privacy. It's on the basis of when life begins. So I do believe that the Constitution, as written, does address privacy issues. And I do hope that Roe versus Wade is revisited, but revisited based on the issue of when life begins. Okay, right, there's Bruce O'Connell. Next, Michelle Woodhouse. I have been actively involved in the pro-life movement for decades. Uh, I was on the steps of the Supreme Court for the Dobbs hearing. I was there uh, this January for the National Right to Life March. I'll be in Raleigh later uh, this month with Human Coalition for another Right to Life event. We will see Roe versus Wade overturned this summer, I have no doubt. And the right to privacy is inherent throughout the Constitution. But this ruling wasn't about privacy. This ruling was complete overreach by the Supreme Court. Um, nowhere in the Constitution, while it does consistently address privacy, to Bruce's point, and I think we're all in agreement on that, nowhere in the Constitution is there a constitutional right to murder an unborn child. And life begins at the moment of conception, having carried two children of my own, those children were children, the moment of conception. And what we have going on in our country now is the most pro-abortion administration that we've ever seen. And, and wanting to put forth in, in a complete reversal of any even common sense discussion. They want abortion on demand up to and including delivery. And Roe v. Wade will be overturned, and it will be overturned not for political reasons, but it will be overturned because the Supreme Court was wrong in the ruling to begin with. We are seeing heartbeat laws coming up across states in this country. We will see that happen when Roe v. Wade is overturned, and I am thrilled to know that in my lifetime and my children's lifetime, this will happen this summer. Okay, Michelle Woodhouse, next, Rod Honeycutt. Yes, sir, Judge. So Justice Rehnquist later admitted that that was – not what he intended for it to protect privacy. It was never pretend, never intended to protect a child from being murdered. That was a mistake. It will be a mistake if we didn't overturn it. Throughout 37 years of service, I had young women who had to make that decision. And I sit with them and I have prayed with them and have counseled them. We have created an atmosphere where we think it's okay to do an abortion. There's always another option. You know, growing up here in the South, in the Bible Belt, uh, that's my heritage, that's my belief, and it's pretty clear uh, from my biblical heritage that sixth commandment, thou shalt not murder. And I'm married to a NICU nurse that fights for children after they're born. I will be their voice before they're born. All right, that's Rod Honeycutt. Finally, Wendy Navarez. Okay. So as far as the privacy issue, I think that's very clear that, um, as it was stated previously today already, that um, we want people to stay out of our medical files. Um, I don't want this to be misconstrued as pro-abortion because I'm not pro-abortion. However, 66% uh, of women who are... Um, who get abortions are under the age of 29. So I think the real issue here um, when we're talking about abortion and Roe v. Wade is really going back to providing access to birth control, condoms, plan B, sex education that doesn't just scrape the surface and preach abstinence because um, our teenagers are going to be teenagers. And um, so we need to be more realistic and use our 21st century science and medicine to really educate them well so that abortion isn't even, it doesn't even have to come on the table because conception doesn't happen to begin with. Um, so really it's, I think it's anti-freedom to, to take away other people's choices and to put our, our opinions of what we believe is right and wrong onto other people. Um, 
And so at the end of the day, I think this is less of a, uh, I think it is a privacy issue, but I think it's less about abortion and more about doing other things to prevent it. Similar to what Mr. Honeycutt said earlier, it's proactive instead of reactive. All right. So we'll go to the rebuttal period. I could Bruce say a O'Connell. little, I'll yeah. rebut just a little bit. I, I've, I've got some people that advise me on educational issues, and they've brought me copies of the curriculum that's being taught in some of the schools, specifically regarding sex education in the schools. And I'll tell you, it's okay to teach sex education, but not if you encourage promiscuity. And from what I've seen, it does not at all encourage abstinence at all. It basically legitimizes having premarital sex among youth. I've read these things. I can't believe what I see. And I'm afraid to say things on the air because I may get blipped. But if anyone, has anyone ever heard of Masturbation Monday? Well, that's taught. That's in the curriculum. Has anyone ever heard of these things where they, they promote safe sex for seventh graders? Excuse me? In my opinion, they ought to promote abstinence to seventh graders. So there is an issue about what's being taught in the schools and how it implicitly encourages sexual activity with our youth. It needs to be the other way around. Encourage abstinence until at least they become adults or until marriage. So that's what I have to say about that. Right. Bruce O'Connell. Next, Michelle Woodhouse. This is where I think, having been so involved in this movement for so long, the true facts of things that we see and we know, 85% of women, when faced with this decision, say if their circumstances were different, they would make a different choice. One of the things I'm so proud to be part of is the work with Human Coalition. Human Coalition, the Susan B. Anthony list, Right to Life, and the RNC have all come together to really look at how we best serve mothers in this situation. And they've put together, each of them in their own lane, a program where we help women across three years to help with job training, child care, um, housing, Section 8 housing, transportation, so that we can help that woman to change her circumstances so she doesn't have to make a decision between killing her unborn baby and keeping it. We're giving the tools and resources there. I recently visited the Human Coalition Crisis Pregnancy Center in Charlotte. 80% of the women they see are victims of human trafficking. So while I agree that we've got issues being taught in our schools, we also have societal issues where women are in these situations, and we as a party are the right-to-life party. That's what we are. We are a pro-life party that is part of our platform. We have to work to make sure that we're doing these type of things to be able to support these women through this very difficult time. Ms. Michelle Woodhouse, now Rod Honeycutt. Absolutely. There's always another option. Yeah. Abortion should be the last option that a young man or woman who is facing that as a couple. But uh, to me, life begins at conception and ends at last natural breath, and I don't want the federal government anywhere involved in it. All right. Wendy? Tavares? So... Um, as far as all those programs, that's amazing, and I love that. And, and unfortunately, that, again, is reactive, so we have to try to keep them from getting in that situation. So better programs for um, avoiding human trafficking as well. Um, but as far as what Bruce had said, um, my kids are in the public school system. They've been in recently. I have a graduate from last year. I have one in 10th grade and two in kindergarten right now. I'm heavily involved in the schools, and I have never heard of any of that. Um, I sign off on the curriculum saying that they can or can't attend. You have the option as a parent to allow your child to go to those or not. I have had uh, discussions with groups of, of girls that I mentor, asking them their opinion of the sex education and what they got from it and whether or not they felt comfortable or it was adequate. So I, I just want to say I think that's some misinformation on some of this that's being told. <laughs> All right. I'm not sure we have built in a, a second ro robot. Even if my no. name was mentioned? <laughs> <laughs> Even if your name was mentioned. Oh, well. Okay. Well, I, 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 but let me do a follow-up uh, along these lines. If, if the... Uh, the health and safety of the mother is at risk. In your mind, is it constitutionally permissible for a, a state to provide for abortion services? In that, in, in, yeah, we'll start with you, Bruce. I'm going to share with you a quick story. Years ago, I knew a couple. They had three children. The mother was pregnant with her fourth Late in the pregnancy, the doctors told her, you have a severe medical problem. 
you're going to die more than likely if you give birth. That couple at that minute was faced with a decision. Do they abort that baby and try to save the life of the mother, or do they risk giving birth to the baby and losing the mother? Now, people, when they hear this story, they ask me, well, how do you know for sure the mother would die? Well, I don't know that. I can only relate the story of what the family was faced with. This family decided, had to decide, do they risk leaving the three children without a mother, or do they abort the fourth child and save the life of the mother? That's a decision that only that family, that couple, their pastor, and their God can make. I don't want the government telling them what to do in a situation like that. So therefore, my position is there can be rare exceptions when it involves the life of the mother. You see, pro-life to me means pro-life. It doesn't just mean the life of the unborn baby. It means every life. All right, Ms. Bruce O'Connell and Michelle Woodhouse. Now, I think as a, as a mother um, who has delivered two uh, amazing kids and lost one uh, during pregnancy, if faced with that decision, that's my decision to make. That's for me and my husband and my doctor to make. Um, and, and that decision would be ours and ours alone. It, I'm grateful I've never had to make that decision. But so few abortions are that. Um, we have watched Planned Parenthood move into our, um, into our urban areas and completely eviscerate an entire generation by normalizing abortion. So when we start to talk about small percentages of exceptions, if the mother may lose her life, cases of incest or rape, those are very, very small percentages of, um, of cases. And again, that's the, you know, but we, that's where the left likes to push the discussion. What about rape? What about incest? What about the life of the mother? Well, what about the 99% of abortions that are done that are not that? All right, honey cat? No, I think we agree across the board, but I think that uh, we are created in an image and he has the final say, and I do not want our government uh, involved in it. Our Constitution is pretty clear. It does not have abortion anywhere in it, and that's what I'll stand on. Right. Last word, uh, Wendy Labar. So the original question was uh, whether or not if the life of the mother was in danger, uh, w should that be covered by health care dollars, federal dollars? That was, I think, the question. Um, I believe that it, again, with Michelle's point, that it is up to the the woman or the couple or, you know, that when it comes down to the life of the mother, I have four children. I was pregnant twice, uh, two other times where I uh, miscarried once and once where I didn't miscarry, but the baby was no longer um, living. And so I had to go through a procedure that, you know, I didn't necessarily want to go through, but I did. Um, that's health care. That's health care. Um, and so if it's going to hurt the life of the mother and that is the decision that they make, then it needs to be covered by health care dollars. All right. Thank you all. The third question, we'll start with Michelle Woodhouse. Uh, a recent Civitas poll, and that's a conservative organization based out of Raleigh, uh, showed that almost 65 percent of the Republicans polled in the survey, I thought that elections in North Carolina were not fairly or honestly conducted. Do you agree or disagree, and do you personally trust that elections here in North Carolina and in the 11th District have been and will be fairly and honestly administered? Um, Quite a shift there. We went from a really robust discussion. That's it, I'm I'm loving that we're all getting to have really robust discussions, and I, I hope the listeners are enjoying it as well. I, I absolutely think that this election integrity is one of the biggest failures of Senator Chuck Edwards, who's in this race. He was the co-chair of the Election Integrity Committee, and they absolutely failed. Now, number one, the federal government, we're all running for federal office. The federal government should have no say, no play at all in state elections. I'm grateful every day that the John Lewis Voting Act failed because it would have been the end of our democracy. But in the state of North Carolina, do I believe that our election in 2020 was fair? Do I believe elections prior to were fair and, and accurate? Not completely. Was there voter fraud? Absolutely. Is there 
pretty much consistently voter fraud? Absolutely. And when I look at the state of North Carolina, where I vote and where your listeners vote, the issues that we've got to address, number one, voter ID was voted on by the people of North Carolina and overturned by radical judges. Number two, same-day voter registration is probably our biggest source of fraud in the state of North Carolina. Our voter rolls are a disaster. We have over 65,000 dead people on the rolls as of today. If you have a, if you have a hyphen or a comma, um, we know that there's a major problem um, there as well. And... Um, the Senate, co the Senate Election Integrity Committee, which Senator Chuck Edwards, who's running in this race, co-chaired, missed the modems. Five counties in the state of North Carolina had modems, four in this congressional district, and they were found by an intern at the North Carolina Republican Party. So do I, do I agree we've got to work to get our elections fair and correct? 100%. Each person sitting here in the four who chose not to come are asking people for the greatest gift they could give us, and that is their vote. People have to trust that the system is working, and the Election Integrity Committee, co-chaired by Edwards, failed. Michelle Woodhouse, a Rod Honeycutt. You know, I've had the pleasure of putting boots on the ground in 15 counties, and as I do my boots on the ground tour, I often go into the uh, county's board of elections, and I've had discussions with all 15. Let me rephrase that. I've had discussions with a lot of the counties. I don't say all 15. I don't mislead. But out in Brevard and Transylvania and out in Cherokee and Buncombe, they are very secure in the way they hosted their elections. And I believe them. I take them their word. Now, outside of this district, outside of our state, there's improvements. We should have voter ID. If you go to the bank, do a transaction, you got to have a voter ID. When you go to the poll, you should have a voter ID. It should be a system that we have in place that has an audit. We shouldn't be waiting 24 days after the election to decide who won. So 100% on board with election integrity, voter ID. But with the 15 counties within our district, I'm on board with what they have told me. Thanks, Rod Honeycutt. Next, Wendy Navarez. So, um... As far as elections being free and fair, I 100% believe they are free and fair. Uh, it is a foundation of our democracy. Uh, and I will say that I'm sure fraud happens. I know it happens. It's been found. But it's not on a mass scale. It's one of those things that we deal with just like we deal with anyone who breaks the law. Um, it is investigated and it's dealt with. Um, so I don't believe that any, any mass fraud took place to um, alter the outcome of an election. I will say that sowing doubt in our election does something uh, motivating, which, you know, is getting people to vote for you. Um, and I would also say that, you know, Mr. Cawthorn, um, the lieutenant governor, and many hundreds of other Republicans were also still voted in um, this last election that everybody claimed there was fraud. Um, it's interesting to look at it from a point of view if if Trump lost somehow, it wasn't fair, but all of these other Republicans managed to make it into office. Um, I do agree that state uh, state administered elections are the way that it needs to stay. Um, and that if anything, we need to put a little bit more money into making sure that they have the resources they need to make sure that everything is kept. Um, you know, integrity is, in, is kept. Um, Rod mentioned 24 days to get a decision. I mean, we used to not have inaugurations until like March and May because um, a lot of people that believe that the machines uh, are causing an issue want to go to paper ballots. Well, I'll tell you, we will be waiting a while for some results if that were the case. Um, there are paper ballots to go back to to verify that the voting machines are correct. And so, again, I stand by the fact that I believe that the elections are free and fair. Bruce Oka? Well, here's my take. <clears throat> I believe there was fraud in the election. I believe there's always been fraud in the elections. I believe the last election did have more fraud than previous ones, but because of COVID, because rules were relaxed, rules were changed at the last minute, and you can't do that. So there was fraud, and there was more fraud than usual. Next, I believe the Board of Elections has the wrong performance criteria. I went to a Board of Elections meeting, and I heard the chairman say to me, 
We are measured, Bruce. Our performance is measured based on the number of people that cast their votes. And I said, wait a minute, shouldn't it be based on the number of correct and legal votes and the integrity of the election? He goes, no, we're graded on the number of people that actually cast a vote. And the last election, we broke records with how many people casted votes. And I thought, well, what if half of them are illegal? That's not a good performance criteria. So the incentive is there and it's in the wrong place. Now, I asked the question at a meeting the other night, who's responsible for election integrity? I saw proof of errors. As Michelle said, the apostrophe in people's names, people that re-register when they're married, et cetera, et cetera. They end up with two unique, supposedly, voter ID numbers. Lots of irregularities. And I raised my hand and I said, well, who's responsible for that? Couldn't get an answer. Well, let me tell you something, folks. If I was the boss, I'd be firing somebody that's responsible for managing these elections. And I'd bring somebody new in and say, you fix it. And if you can't buy computer software that can uncover duplicate names, then we need somebody else doing this. Because this is not rocket science. If two Joe Blows get two separate numbers and they live at the same address, some computer software somewhere should be able to catch that. And right now, no one will take responsibility. No one. Bruce O'Connell, well, Michelle, back to rebuttal. Yeah, and, and again, yeah. I think what we're all talking about here, it's a state issue, right? We're all running for federal office, but this is a state issue. And um, as all being voters in this state, it's critical for us to know and, and for all the voters to feel safe with the election. Um, there was voter fraud in Buncombe County. There was absolutely voter fraud in Buncombe County. Every Republican, with the exception of one, lost, and they all lost by the exact same margin. And when Senator Edwards, which should be who you want to fire, Bruce, when Senator Edwards was presented with video documentation, photographic documentation from the Republican Party in Buncombe County of suspicious activity, his response was, quote, I won Buncombe County. What do you want me to do? The Board of Elections, the way that the state of North Carolina is set up is a partisan a partisan organization. It's based on who's in the governor's mansion, right? So we have a Democrat now, so the 3-2 margin with the Board of Elections across all 100 counties is driven by that. So if we want to get if we want to get election integrity right in the state of North Carolina, we need to remove the partisanship component of the Board of Elections. That would be, to me, the very first step. And again, state issue, not federal, but I think that's the first place we start. Rod Hunnigan. The Republican Party, one of our articles there is free elections with, I think it's number nine in our articles. Absolutely agree that it should not be at the federal level and agree with Michelle on it being de-partyized, what the right term there is, make sure it's not political, uh, that it is independent and there should be a panel there that has the ability to go in and certify, but it's gotta be one vote, one ID, and it's gotta be audible. Wendy Navarez. <laughs> so I, voter ID was just mentioned, and that was passed by the people of, uh, of the state. So um, I would say it probably needed to be reformed or modified in, in a certain way. Um, voter ID should be there. If, if that's, you know, if that's what the people decided and that'll make people feel better about our elections being free and fair. I also believe that at 18 years old, everybody should be registered as unaffiliated. And if they choose a party, then they, they can go that route. Um, it shouldn't be something they have to do as a second step. It's automatic. You're 18, you can vote, period. Um, also with voter ID, making sure that people get a free ID at 18. I mean, it just needs to happen. If that's going to be a requirement, it shouldn't be a hindrance. Um, going back to losing at the same margins, the reason they typically lose at the same marginal rate is because they, it, it was a vote down the ticket. Uh, people rarely vote across and around. Um, the other thing about the duplicates that I would say that I wouldn't want to have a computer program necessarily uh, take that is, you know, John Smith or, you know, Bruce O'Connell Jr. or, um, you know, <laughs> anybody with similar names that live at different addresses um, would be in a situation where they may not, when they show up thinking they're okay to go vote, their their registration is inactive or they've been taken off the rolls. So um, 
unfortunately, knowing how the ele uh, election process works, um, dealing with Social Security, um, you know, there's so many systems. There's not one system that talks to all these different organizations, whether it's the Postal Service, um, whether it's uh, Social Security or uh, other entities that find out that people have passed away. Um, so it, it's not that simple. Um, and it takes a couple months. And I believe the Buncombe County meeting that a lot of us attended, um, where the Board of Elections was informing us of how they take care of these duplicates or these um, issues with uh, people who have passed away, is that it takes them roughly three or four months to really clean that up. They do not have the manpower to really make that happen on a very quick, as much as we have elections, not not as quick as we would like. People die every day, <laughs> you know, so. All right, Bruce O'Connell. I'd like to make one statement for the record. I'm 100% in favor of voter ID. And if any one of the candidates running for Congress was not in favor of that, I would hope people would hold him accountable. And I will say no one in this room right now is not in favor of voter ID, but I will tell you all something. There is a candidate running for Congress right now as a Republican who voted against voter ID. And I want you all to do your homework, figure out who it is, and remember, if he voted against voter ID and is telling you that he's for voter ID, that is a politician. And we don't need to send politicians back to Washington. So you, you, and, and you're not going to tell us that. No, you because, do I'm, the research. because okay. I'm not going to play that game. I want people to do their own homework. Okay, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask one random follow-up question, just a yes or no. Uh, the group of voters registered as unaffiliated has now exceeded statewide both the Republican registration and the Democratic registration. Would you support a law that required unaffiliated voters to be allowed to serve on election boards across the state and on the state board of elections? Wendy Navarro. Yes. Bruce? Yes. Michelle's thinking about it. I just want to make sure I understand yeah, your yeah, question right, right. Uh, before I answer it. So when we look at county boards and the state board of elections, right. which are appointments via the Republican Party, Democratic Party, and Correct. then approved by the, the governor, um, in theory, I think it should be representative of, of the electorate populace. Who would put them on? Who would put them forth? And how would they be approved since unaffiliated voters don't have a f structural party? Right. So... I think in theory, but then how do you put that into practice? Right. Rod Honeycutt. Yeah, it's a state issue, and at the federal level, I don't want to see the federal government weighing in it. So as a federal candidate, I'm not going to touch it, yeah, let yeah. the states figure it out, but agree that it's got to be represent our district and with unaffiliated voters. I now have 30% um, of all the majority coming through there. they got to be included. It is a democracy for we the people, so let's figure out how to include them. But do it at the state level. All right, thank you, Rod Honeycutt. And so now to our next question, this will go first to you, Rod Honeycutt. Uh, the national park system is a major economic driver in western North Carolina, particularly the Blue Ridge Parkway and the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, yet funding for staff and facilities has been reduced over the past number of years. Uh, if elected to Congress, would you support major funding increases for the park system and increases in compensation for park employees. So this being my home, as I've traveled around for 37 years, I'd get on an airplane and I'd see a magazine in the back of a chair that celebrated Western North Carolina, places like Pinnacle Point, places like Craggy Garden, places like Sliding Rock and Mount Mitchell. I was so proud to know that that was in our district. But I believe President Trump uh, had it right in 2020 as he put a large bill towards correcting what we're talking about today. So I think the application of that bill going forward is important and to make sure that we look after, you know, our great uh, fire responders working on the parkway and our great emergency services. But I think that equally important in this discussion is the payment in lieu of taxes. Right now we've got counties who are responding up on the parkway who do not get reimbursed for those runs that they make up there. So taking care of our parkways, absolutely. Putting more money towards it, I think President Trump had it right in his bill. It was the Great American Outdoor Act of 2020. 
I think we've got to get behind it. And in this last bill that came through this administration, put more money. So to make sure that we apply that money, to me, is more important. But critical is taking care of our counties, that Graham County. 79% of that is a national forest. That Pelt money, taking care of them as they're running, is equally as important. But want to see our great Blue Ridge Mountains taken care of. That's our economy. That's our tourism. But the second third order effect of that tourism, we've got to look into account how we take care of it. Okay. That's right, Honeycutt. Wendy Navarez. So uh, as far as the National Park Services go or system goes, 100% agree. Um, funding for staff and facilities need to increase. Um, being able to recruit more staff in to those, uh, I, you know, just like every other industry right now, they're, they're having a tough time hiring. Um, so definitely getting into the school systems and advocating so that we can get people out of high school going into programs that would benefit uh, the National Park Service. Um, also, the Blue Ridge Parkway alone brings in $1.3 billion. It's a huge economic driver for, for our district, so it would be a return on our, our investment if we put money into our park system. Um, but it also it benefits us as far as bringing other tourism in uh, to other areas. It also promotes health. Um, I believe that our park systems right now, um, if you you know, if you go and spend any time in them, their, you know, their maintenance is lacking and uh, being able to bring them up into um, really future standards for access, especially people with disabilities and things would be uh, a huge um, step forward. Um, the Acousta Trail is something that was recently brought up. Uh, it's a more local uh, thing, but it, it kind of drives back to utilizing our natural um, resources as part of our economy and our health initiatives. Um, and I would say that, you know, Madison Cawthorn called it communism. It's not communism to reinvest in our country. Um, God gave us this beautiful, beautiful country, and we have to make sure we maintain it. And um, that's why, like Rod said, people are so uh, driven to come here um, for its beauty. So 100% um, we have to reinvest. Wendy Navarez next. Bruce O'Connell, who may have an opinion on this topic. Yeah, I don't know where to start, but listen, I've been at the Pisgah for 42 years dealing with the Department of the Interior, and I can tell you, they don't need any more money. They need somebody that knows how to run a business. There's too much waste in government. We need to take a business approach to government. I can only tell you, in 40 years, I've tried to operate a business in spite of the federal government trying to breathe down my neck every day, telling me to do ridiculous things that don't make any sense. I'm a conservationist. I work in a national park. I love the mountains, and I want to protect them. But I don't need a federal government bureaucrat coming up there and weighing the order of French fries that I put on the plate. That's what we're paying money for. Why don't they take that money and pay somebody to mow the lawn? And that way the grass doesn't become two feet tall. And Rob, Rod brought up PILT funds. That is absolutely correct. Payments in lieu of taxes. You have to understand that many of our counties have lots of national forest land and park land. They can get no tax revenue from those wide expanses of property. That is a disadvantage to those, those counties. They're protecting all of that land for us, but they're getting no revenue in the way of taxes. PILT funds, payment in lieu of taxes, is a government program that I do believe in, and those counties are getting screwed. Those amounts are not being adjusted with inflation. We need to look at that. But as far as sending more money at a problem, well, that is the problem. Everything is more money, more money, more money. How about better management? How about getting a business approach to this stuff? and, and getting, a, getting away from all these bureaucrats that are just trying to keep their job and not risk their retirements. That's what's going on. I've seen it firsthand. And I got to tell you, that's one of the reasons why I'm running for Congress, because I've had enough of big government. We've got to get big government shrunk quick. I'm a believer in limited government. It's got very few roles. And one of those roles is not to weigh the amount of French fries I put on a plate. And that was Bruce O'Connell, who has an opinion on the subject. Yeah. Michelle, what there we go. We've, we've yeah. talked about yeah. constitutional law with a constitutional expert, and I get to follow Bruce talking <laughs> about the national parks. Um, but I, I do think we've, we've hit on a really important issue, both Rod and Bruce, on PILT. 
And the counties that are hurt by this are the poorest counties, not only in our district, but the poorest counties in the state of North Carolina. And they truly are at an incredible disadvantage. So we've got to look at that program. I think we're all in agreement that the program in theory is, is a good program, but the counties that are the most impacted are the counties that can afford to be the, they're the least, uh, they can afford it the least to be impacted by it. Um, you know, I, I have to say, I, I'd look at this and, and would immediately make a, a federal spending cut to what we're doing for illegal immigrants that are coming across our country with the federal dollars that we're putting towards those who are breaking the law as they come across our border in droves. And let's use some of that money to do some sensible things with our national parks. Um, I don't want my French fries weighed. I want my order to be big and fattening, Bruce, so make sure that's <laughs> happening for me. But we, I, I think your point is such a valid one, is we look at certain situations with the federal government and it just becomes so nonsensical that voters just throw their hands up and say, you've got to be kidding me. These are the things that we're talking about. These are the things that bureaucrats, not only in Raleigh, where it's a swamp with a southern accent, but in Washington, D.C., and, and I think we're all of the same ilk, and I believe this wholeheartedly. Draining the swamp doesn't mean changing the water. It means changing the philosophy. It means draining the water. It means looking at programs and saying this is a complete and utter waste of federal tax dollars um, versus moving it from one, one coconut shell over to, the, to another coconut shell. So we've got to get back to common sense policies, and I think that's why you're seeing people run – for this seat that have life experience, business experience, military experience, because what we found is when you put a 26-year-old with no experience into the position, you end up with big problems. It's Michelle Woodhouse. Uh, we'll go to the rebuttal. Rod Honeycutt. So I agree with Bruce on the management part. If you've got the Cherokee, which is our furthest county out there, they used to have a campground out there called Hanging Dog Campground. Federal government has shut that campground down because it was too expensive. The men and women, children who live out there now have to go to another state or another county to build memories. We have lost that, and we've got to bring the management back. I believe the money's there. We've got to stop the money part, but it's about managing. And it's about allowing our families to see the beauty that God has given to us here and build those memories. So let's keep in mind actually what we're doing and why we're doing it. It's the people out in Cherokee County. Uh, Wendy Navarro. <laughs> yes. So uh, three things uh, as far as rebuttals go. Um, real quick, it's a dig, but the 26-year-old with no experience is there right now because Ms. Woodhouse advocated for him for over a year. Um, and so let's just be clear. When I hire somebody as a hiring supervisor at a manufacturing plant or I'm looking to put them in a certain position in the military, it was I looked at their experience. I looked at their resume and see if they have the education and training. And when somebody doesn't have that, they automatically go to the no stack. So that's that. As far as the um, Department of Interior, I agree it needs to be more efficiently ran and effective so that it's better benefiting the citizens um, that are utilizing those spaces. Um, and as far as PILT goes, I personally agree with PILT, I think, as everybody here does. Um, but let's understand what PILT is. We're taking taxes from other people in other places and reallocating those funds to another place that did not get taxed. Um, if you don't believe in socialism... That that kind of exactly defines what that is. So it's not that I disagree because, again, business does not always solve the problem of government because government has a double bottom line. That double bo bottom line is, yes, be a good steward of the taxpayers' dollars, but also make sure that we are doing the things that best benefit our society as a whole, the, the good of all. So. Wendy Navarro is Bruce O'Connor. The people that work <clears throat> for the NPS and in the Department of the Interior are good people. Mm -hmm. They're not all bad. They're stuck in a dysfunctional system, a dysfunctional bureaucracy that encourages them to be dysfunctional and incentivizes them to not use common sense. I can tell you for a fact that when I'm told to do something that is ridiculous and I ask the bureaucrat, why would you want me to do that? It makes absolutely no sense. More than once, I've gotten an answer. Well, whatever, whoever told you, Bruce, that the government makes sense? 
And then I say to them, well, let's go to the guy above you and try to convince him that it makes no sense. And the typical answer I get is, Bruce, I've got two years till retirement, and I don't want to rock the boat and jeopardize my retirement. So it's not the person. It's the system that needs to be fixed. And the only way to fix a system like the Department of the Interior is from the federal level. And that's what we can do if we get to Congress. Certainly, I've got intimate experience with it, and that will be one of my priorities. Reverend Bruce O'Connell, Michelle Woodhouse, last word. All right, thanks. Well, the next question, which is, tell you what I'm going to do. We're going to, I'm going to pull a name out of the hat here, and we'll start with this one. All right, I don't know. Michelle. All right. All right. Uh, and then we'll just go around that way. Um, the incumbent who's been referenced here, Mr. Cawthorn, has been endorsed by President Trump and has consistently criticized what he calls rhinos, Republicans in name only, establishment Republicans, and others who aren't supportive of uh, Mr. Trump. What is your perspective on that, and what's your vision for the Republican Party going forward? Well, I can tell you what I, what I think our party is, and I'll tell you what I, I hope our party won't ever be. We are the party of the working class, of the farmer, the veterans, the forgotten man and woman, people that are suffering under the elitist agenda of Joe Biden. We are the party of Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass. We're the party of closed borders and free markets. But what we are not is the party of politicians like Senator Richard Burr that gave cover to Comey and Mueller and Biden, voted, for, voted guilty on Trump, for the Republicans that crossed over and voted for an infrastructure bill that was 3% infrastructure and did it in some ways to just because of their Trump derangement and Trump hatred. This party is about the people. It is a we the people party. And my husband was a White House appointee under President Trump. Um, I thought he had great policies. But the party is bigger than any person. And when I look at our party... And the reason I bring up someone like a Senator Burr, which some people may call a rhino, I don't tend not to use that term. Um, when someone gets elected on the back of Republican activists and Republican volunteers like me, who've spent the greater part of three decades, longer than really anyone sitting in this room, working to get Republicans elected from the bottom of the ballot to the top, they go there on the platform of the Republican Party. They are elected on the sweat equity of volunteers who are out working the polls, snow, rain, sleet, whatever it takes to get conservatives elected. Why people get so upset is they get in on that principle and then they either get to Raleigh or Washington, D.C., or even at the local level, and they forget who got them there. And that is the problem. And then they only remember us when it's time to, for re-election. And there are consequences for the votes. So we are the party. Our party has changed. We are not the party of you know, cocktail parties and pleated pants and elitist Raleigh country club centrist politicians. We are the party of real working people, Party, the party of people like my parents who are high school educated, union retirees, salt of the earth, Second Amendment, people who raise their kids with honor and integrity. And that's who we are as a party. We are not a party of one person. Michelle Woodhouse, now Rod Honeycutt. All right, I'm putting boots on the ground in 15 counties. The first place I go to in each county is their courthouse. Each one of those courthouses reflect the men and women of that county and what's important to them. If you go out to Rutherford County, big statue out there with one word on the bottom of it, of a soldier standing on top of it, has the word devotion. When I got home in April after 37 years of serving our country, devotion was missing first responders working for 25 years without a retirement. Bridges on the north end of Buncombe County washed away with senators and representatives walking by those mistakes. I was never allowed to walk by mistake in the military. If I would have treated the men and women of Western North Carolina the way they have been treated as a commander in the Army, I'd have been court-martialed or relieved. We don't walk by mistakes. We are a party that has 10 articles in it. It starts with family, the economy, individual liberty, sanctity of life, state government, elections, education, justice, environment, and federal policy. When I was in the third grade at Woodfin, calling people's names, I'd have been took outside and met the principal. I stopped calling people names a long time ago. 
I'm more about action and going to work, not talking. We've been talking a long time. Those 90 days I got home, that's when I put my name in the hat. I said, hey, I've got experience at the federal level. I've been advising Congress. I've seen the hard work. I know what it takes. We don't walk by mistakes. We don't treat people like second-class citizens here in this district. We are a proud people of Western North Carolina. I'm going to fight every day. I'm going to work hard every day for every man, woman, and child of Western North Carolina. I agree with it's time for a change. But businessmen have been there too long. They've been spending too much. Let's send a dedicated warrior with a warrior's ethic to Washington, D.C. to represent 85,000 veterans, first responders, and families in this district. Rod Honeycutt, Wendy Navarez. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> the Republican Party in the future. I believe we need to regain some integrity uh, and restore that. As far as being called a rhino, I'm probably the one that's been called that the most in the room. Um, but I would say to everybody who says that and to Mr. Cawthorn that, you know, he is a representative in name only. And that's really what a rhino is. I believe in truth. I believe in truth over theatrics and celebrity. I believe in honor and honorable actions over hostility. I believe in service over self, which we've seen a lot of self. Um, our party is needs to get back to the founding principles that we believe in, not just particular platform targets, but true values in everything that we do. And then I agree uh, with Michelle that part, you know, um, party is bigger than any one person, but our country is bigger than any one party. And that uh, it's country over party at a certain point. Um, if you're being failed by leaders within the party, then you have to stand up uh, for that. So as far as sending a warrior or a businessman, I, I don't agree with any of that. I believe you need to send a servant leader you need to send somebody who has those mindsets, but also brings their servant heart along with them. And so I just want to say that I'm a representative for all. And that at the end of the day, no matter who gets elected into any office, state, federal or local, that they're representing all the Democrats, all the unaffiliated and all the Republicans. And that if our party wants to move forward, especially with the largest electorate being unaffiliated, then they need to understand that. And our party, as other people have mentioned, is kind of dying out, um, aging out, really. Um, we have to be more hospitable and in our efforts to bring in more people into the party, um, which means you have to be tolerant, you have to listen, you have to become more diverse, and unfortunately, I'm not seeing that when I show up right now, so we, we have to grow. We have some growing to do. Wendy Navarez, Bruce O'Connell. We do need to send a warrior to Congress. Thank you, Bruce. <laughs> Look back at what I've done in 2013 when I sued the federal government because of their ridiculous government shutdown. That's an example of me being a little bit of a warrior, even though I'm not a veteran. We also do need to send a person with business experience. Why? Well, look back at our last president. His policies were spot on. We had the best country we've had in a long time when President Trump was in office. So I believe a warrior and a businessman is what we need. Now, as far as the future of the Republican Party, I believe we do have the right message. I believe our message of self-reliance the freedom to fail, and our message of not wanting to rely on our enemies to fuel and feed ourselves is the correct message. The problem we've got is communicating that message in a way that does not run people off. We need to learn how to communicate that common sense message without judgment and without vindictiveness. We've got to reach out to those unaffiliated and moderate Democrats and just explain to them that our approach of common sense and self-reliance is the right way to go. You know, there's a story about the mouse and the free cheese. You all ought to look it up sometime. There is no free cheese. And you know, if you want perfect freedom, go to prison. You'll get all the freedom, you'll get all the, no, if you want perfect security, excuse me, <laughs> go, to, go to prison. You'll have all the security in the world, but no freedom. I would rather have freedom as opposed to perfect security. 
We need to break down the walls that we've got between the, the groups, the parties, and improve communication and be willing to listen to all sides of the discussion. Less talk, more listening. Bruce O'Connell, Michelle Woodhouse. So I think one of the um, points I would make and in, in kind of one of the advantages of, of having served as a, a GOP volunteer and activist, having been the district chair here, taking a party here that was basically on life support when I stepped in as district chair, the tent was growing, incredible enthusiasm. People wanted to be engaged and involved. Um, I will never waver from the Republican platform. I, I will not. Um, that if, if you are in support of the Republican platform as it stands, then you're not a Republican. And the Democrats do not waver from their platform. They stay true and firm on their platform. Um, you know, I, I think we're all in agreement. We don't like the name calling, but what I what I despise more than that is when I work my behind off as a volunteer to get a Republican elected who goes there and forgets the principles upon which they are supposed to stand. It is, it, it, we are a two-party system. It's what we are. And the differences between Democrats and Republicans at today in Washington, D.C., in Raleigh, with politicians is stark. I think the difference is when you talk to people on the street, when you talk to maybe the people, the seven of us sitting in this room, our differences are probably not stark. I think most people are in agreement that we need to close our borders and we need to deal with 30-year high inflation and illegal immigration that's out of control and human trafficking and failing schools and CRT and SEL and taxation without representation and, and all of the nonsense that we can all make long lists of. But we have to make sure that when we're sending elected officials, no matter where they're going, that they're solving those problems standing firm on the platform and the principles of the party and that we never ever waver from those and when they don't do it they're fired and we put someone else in who will do it michelle woodhouse ron honeycutt you know the focus of our party going forward has to be to increase it and that is to reach across the aisle to the unaffiliated voter and to bring them under the tent and i believe that as they're looking for leadership in our party they're looking for someone who can say we live in a country and a world surrounded by 192 countries. We live in a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. Our local issues matter, but you've got to have a little bit of foreign policy experience to understand how foreign policy affects our domestic interactions. You know, as we look at Ukraine, our country watched for seven months as Russia built up on the border. I started calling in December, we've got to stop. Why that matters, Ukraine, number two exporter of wheat in the world. We're going to start paying $15 a box for cereal. We've got to start looking forward as leaders how we now mitigate that, how we get our farmers and our agriculture to mitigate that shortage that wasn't identified by anyone in our industry, anyone in the government. You've got to have proactive versus reactive leadership. And I think that's what they're looking for. They're not looking for... I'm the big R, I'm the little R, I'm the big D, I'm the little D, or I'm the unaffiliated. They're looking for an American. There's one denominator on the bottom of that list. It's American. And as long as we have the same voice and we agree, and I put it back to three things from my military experience, and these guys have heard it. Can you shoot, move, or communicate? That's all I cared about for three, 37 years. I've boiled that down to now. Do you love our country? Do you love our neighbors? And do you respect our laws? If you can do those three things, I can work with you. There's going to be two out of ten that we never agree on. We're never going to agree on abortion. We're never going to agree on Second Amendment. But those other eight, we can have a discussion on what's best for the United States. And I'm going to be the Western North Carolina first candidate that goes to Washington and works hard every day for the men and women of Western North Carolina. Ron Honeycutt, Wendy Navarez. So I 100% agree with Rod that, you know, it's about the people. Um, and so it brings me back to um, the two-party system that was mentioned. Um, at some point, the people within the power structure of the two parties um, get to a point where that unwavering loyalty to the party is blind and ignores the voice of the people. Um, and so we can never just be so unwaveringly loyal to a party if we're not willing to step back 
listen to the people and really move forward from there. And listening to the people doesn't mean just the people in your circles. It means listening to everyone. And um, so really, you know, not just showing up to Republican venues or just Democratic. And this is for both parties here. I'm not talking about just our party. This is both parties. We have to show up to each other's things, listen, which I think was mentioned before, we need to do more listening, and really put the people over everything else. Adina Boris, uh, Bruce, pick up. To comment on something Wendy just said, loyalty to the party is part of the problem. It needs to be loyalty to principles, not to the party. When I address an employee, I never criticize the person. I always look at the behavior. Well, the same would hold true with loyalty to the party versus loyalty to the principles. Some of these party members up there are rhinos. They say one thing and they do something else. But I do believe in conservative constitutional principles. And I don't care if it's a Republican, an unaffiliated, or a Democrat. As long as they believe in conservative constitutional principles, I can work with them. I'm loyal to principles, not to people. Thank you, sir. We have one more question. Everybody up for one more? Yeah. All right. All right, good. Uh, another non-controversial topic here to discuss. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and I'll pull another name out of the hat here so we're fair. Wendy, you get the okay. first one here. All right. um, How is it that me and Michelle always get picked first for everything? Well, that's right. No, it, no, it, no, 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 it's no. random. It happens, it like, all the time. That's right. Well, get you to pick we just lottery the for them to try to keep up with. I, that's exactly right. Well, we need our first uh, woman representative in this district. Amen. So, um, well, let me ask the question first. Oh, jump it ahead of sorry. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, there's an acknowledged crisis on our border with Mexico with an ever increasing number of people fleeing other countries and trying to get into the United States. Considering both security needs and humanitarian needs, what steps should the federal government take to address these issues? Yeah. Wendy Navarro. So, this is. This crisis has been accumulating over decades, uh, more so from from uh, you know the early mid two thousands um, to present, and so now we've gotten to a point where there is a backlog of about two years for immigration cases to be processed, and as we've all seen in both administrations, we do not. Uh, care for the humanitarian crisis that we saw where there were people basically in cages or imprisoned um, and not being adequately cared for. So the way to adjust this is, again, not to be reactive, but to be proactive. We need to increase the resources so that we can actually process people at the border quicker, get them sent back to where um, you know, where they can be helped uh, in their home countries or if they are truly seeking asylum, make that process reformed so that it's more fluid. Um, you know, sending people out for two years to establish a livelihood and a sense of home here and then asking them to come back to court to then send them away is also inhumane to me. Um, you know, so we do need to increase border security. Um, but we also need to in, in, uh, increase the resources where we can process these cases much quicker and streamline immigration. Because there are people that came here legally that want their spouses or their children or their mothers and fathers to come join them. And so there has to be a way to streamline that so that we don't um, create hardships on families. Um, I believe in generational uh, knowledge being passed down and you, you hate to lose that or have people lose that in the process. Um, also working internationally with the source countries, um, we do document um, every single person that comes through and we know what countries they come from. So we really need to go back to what kind of things can we do to help these countries address the fact that people are leaving in droves from those countries. Um, again, being 
uh, proactive vice reactive. It's not necessarily trying to funnel money to them or anything of that nature, but more so trying to help them address some of the the concerns um, that they may have uh, in their country. Um, and, and part of that is educating. Um, so, yeah, as far as border crisis, we definitely have one. Um, I believe we need to be humane and look at family dynamics and make sure that we streamline the process for those who are trying to come here and be upstanding citizens. Um, and that's that's pretty much all I have on border crisis. All right. Bruce O'Connell is next. Regarding the border, sometimes the truth requires few words. Secure the border. Common sense. Legal immigration, common sense. Now, Bob, the way this question was posed, you talk about the humanitarian crisis. Maybe that word needs to be defined because to me, the real humanitarian crisis is not what those migrants are facing from where they come from. The real humanitarian crisis is what happens when they cross our border. Fentanyl, human trafficking, sex slavery, child abuse, drug overdoses. That's the humanitarian crisis. It's what happens after they come across the border. And you know, we need to stop attracting them. We need to end the incentives that's driving this migration. Has anyone ever asked themselves how these illegals, when they come across the border, support themselves? You know, I could use about 50 more employees. I can't find them. Do you think I can hire any of these illegals that come across? Not really. They're illegal. Has anyone asked the question, well, how do they work? How do they get money? How do they exist in our society if they're illegal? I can tell you what they do. They struggle or they work under the table, don't pay taxes, and put a burden on society. Or, or they have to resort to crime. This is a mess, and it's a mess because of the policies of the present administration. This problem didn't exist when President Trump was in office. The real humanitarian crisis occurs after they cross the border. We've got to secure the border, we've got to have legal immigration, and we've got to use plain old Western North Carolina common sense. Bruce O'Connell, next, Michelle Woodhouse. I agree. It's the it's the number one national security risk for us right now. We have to close the border, build the wall. Title 42 needs to go into law and not be repealed like it's going to be, because what we're seeing today is nothing compared to what we're going to see with the Biden administration rolling back Title 42. Every single state is now a border state. Every single one. Talk to sheriffs across these 15 counties and they will tell you fentanyl is here. Fentanyl is killing our children. The Mexican drug cartel controls the border. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. They're bringing drugs in one lane. They're human trafficking in another lane. 40% increase in human trafficking. Three million illegals have crossed the border since Biden has gone into office. I sat with the Fraternal Order of Police. I've sat with them many times. There are plane loads of illegals coming into the Asheville airport. It is happening. We are a border state. And... I think one of the first steps to solution is to get the border patrol from underneath Homeland Security. They need to operate as their own separate LEO and not be part of a politicized leg of the federal government. And and, and I, we do have a humanitarian crisis. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. When we saw those Haitians living under a bridge, it was heart-wrenching. People want to come to this country. It, that is, and, and it's the greatest country in the world. And I'm, I love that they want to come here. But there's a legal path to getting here. And breaking the law in order to get here is not the way to get here. We have an immigration system. We need to implement the immigration system. Farmers here in Western North Carolina need immigrants to work. And we've got to get back to an E-Verify system. We need to be looking at agricultural visas, which we've completely walked away from, and figure out how do we solve this crisis in a way that's legal. We haven't even touched on the federal government dollar drain for all the illegals that are here that use Mission Hospital, other facilities across our district and across this state as emergency rooms. We've, we have let illegals into our country, and what we've created is a humanitarian crisis for the citizens of this country. Michelle Woodhouse, that's next, Rod Honeycutt. 
Yeah, while we've been sitting here, we've talked close the southern border, put physical walls in place. But, you know, I think it's the, again, proactive versus reactive. I want to see increased border agent manning. I want to see increased joint patrols uh, between us and the southern border states, southern border countries. We've got to leverage technology. We've also got to uh, reform our immigration policy. I think we all agree on that. We're living in a 1950s immigration era when we're living in 2022. I've been promoting select the best to protect the rest, uh, taking young men and women out of high school, helping their family with education. I want to take that and apply that to these 15 counties right now that we're talking about who has a deficit of us being border states. So Lowell Griffin out in Henderson County has one of the best programs that I've seen as I walk through the 15 counties. He's got a liaison officer who represents the district. They come in and they're saying, here's where the drug's at. Here's where the human trafficking's at. I think we've got to adopt programs like that across our district to stop that flow. But it comes down to priorities. Our Border Patrol agents have been abused for so long. They're disheartened. With Title 42, more disheartened, mm -hmm. we've got to come up with a way to incentivize, optimize, recruit and train our southern border. There's lots of ways to do it and put the means behind it that makes us secure. But I don't want to become just focused on that southern border right now. We've got three other borders, our east, west, and our north borders. The way we left Afghanistan with that debacle, we are now at a threat across our whole nation. So we've got to be more than just myopic on that one border. Let's expand our aperture and look across the whole country. It is a national security problem. It's a national defense problem that we've got to tackle at the federal level. That's right, Honeycutt. Uh, quick, quick, quick rebuttal, I'll Wendy try Navarro. To make it as yeah, quick sure. as I can. Yeah. So um, I think it would be um, a bad way to go forward to paint immigrants as criminals and evil. Um, I do not believe the majority that come across the border are trying to do bad things. Um, but I do believe that you're correct. The cartel is controlling things on their side of the border and that that needs to be addressed. And that's honestly, I know for a fact we have National Guard at the border and that that is now considered a deployment within our own country. Um, the economy has always been boosted by immigrant workers here, especially in farming and uh, construction, and you can still see that to this day. So um, the other issue as far as the fentanyl goes, um, you know, it's it's the CCP and China and those industries over in China that are creating the fentanyl that's going to Mexico that is then coming here. So, again, this is something we have to follow it back to the sources of the issues and really address that instead of viewing some of these people who are just really trying to look for a better life as the enemy. Sorry, Bruce. Just to be clear, I love Mexicans. Me Espanol no es bueno. Me too, I'm married. Pero practico <laughs> todos los días. That being said, no one said all of them were evil. We just said there's a problem. And we just said that the human, I said the humanitarian crisis happens after they cross the border because that's where our economy is getting hit also. You said they work in, in construction and they work on the farms. That's great. They're still doing it, but they're doing it illegally right now. They're not paying into the system. You know, we I agree with you. We need to make legal immigration a priority. We need to have worker programs. They need to pay into the system with taxes, and they need to be able to go back home after they pick the crops if that's what they want. But certainly to allow them to work here illegally helps no one. It makes a criminal out of the immigrant. It makes a criminal out of the employer, and we get no tax revenue payroll taxes or otherwise from the person doing the work. None of that makes any sense. And I keep coming back to it. It's not rocket science. It's just common sense. How can anybody not see how easy this is to fix with a little good old common sense? I mean, we get back to E-Verify. I think we're all really kind of talking about the same thing. What we've seen happen in the agricultural communities across this state is immigrants would work here harvesting tobacco and apples, and they would go out east to harvest sweet potatoes. And I'm, I am in complete support of people coming here and living the American dream. There's a legal way to do it. If you get here breaking the law, you broke 
the law. If anyone in this room broke the law, you know what would happen? We would get arrested. Maybe some people who aren't in this room that break the law don't get arrested, but um, you would get arrested. So, Michelle, try sneaking into Mexico correct. and see what happens to you. Absolutely. You know, and I think it is we look at um, we all know that we have a broken system. The system is broken and we have to be reactive and proactive. We have to fix what's broken. But we have three million illegals who have come across the border since Joe Biden became president. And we have no clue where they are. Are, are all of them bad people? Of course not. But the bad actors that are here need to be found and sent back and make sure that we don't have a re-entry because we start to look at the re-entry touches with the, the illegal immigrants. Again, we have put our border patrol in a no-win situation. If they try to engage with a drug dealer or a drug mule coming across the border, they're the one. They're the ones who get prosecuted. We have to be able to make sure that we have them equipped, which is why I think they have to come out of a politicized, dysfunctional department like Homeland Security. Rod Honeycutt. I think we'll look across this room, we'll all agree we're not experts. But I have taken the time to find experts in the field to advise me. So for law enforcement, I have a great chief, former Waynesville and Hendersonville chief of police, Bill Hollingshead. He's advised me on everything law. Kirby Johnson, great farmer out in Henderson, has advised me on all things agriculture, which led me to an immigration lawyer. So I have surrounded myself by subject matter experts, and I will use those subject matter experts to craft my opinion. And in Washington, as we're voting on laws, I will reach back to the experts in Western North Carolina who advise me to make sure that I'm not crippling someone like Kirby Johnson, who has 300 immigrants every day working for him to help us. So to me, it's about knowing what resources, how to be proactive and reactive as what, how we're getting after it, but it's about protecting our everyday way of life. People are scared right now because of drugs in the streets, human trafficking. We've got to stop it. We are a country made of Christian Judeo laws, and we've got to get back to it. That's right, Honeycutt. All right, we're, we're going into our closing statements in just a second, but I have to do a uh, point of privilege, one follow-up on, on the immigration issue, and that is it's probably been 30 or 40 years since the Congress of the United States whether controlled by the Democrats or controlled by the Republicans or split control, they have been totally unable to come up with workable solutions to the problems each of you have identified. If you're elected to Congress, would you be willing to compromise some to try and find a workable solution to the immigration crisis at our border? Wendy Navarro's. I would say, of course, I'm willing to work across the aisle to make sure that we can get something that actually functions in place instead of working again off of something that's decades old. Um, I I think it it's maybe oversimplifying this, but typically the people who come here to work in farming and and things like that they come um, during harvest seasons or they move around. If you go to the airport, you can get pre-authorized to skip security, right? I don't understand why these workers that are performing the same task every harvest, we can't create a system that makes it easier for them to do that and come here. Um, so, you know, they have to go back and go through a process and then come back. And it's just, it's very uh, cumbersome for the people who own these farms to really go through this process and make sure that they have the uh, amount of manpower they need to get the job done. So, uh, of course, I would I would work across the aisle to get something that's functional um, in place for immigration and for uh, migrant workers. Bruce Compromise is the wrong word. Common sense is the right word. <laughs> What we do is we figure a way to let migrant workers come across, work legally, make money, pay taxes, and then go back home. We find a way to let restaurant and hotel workers come across the border legally and work at the Pisgah Inn or work at any of these hotels in Asheville that can't get their rooms cleaned or their food cooked. It's not about compromise. It's about common sense. Follow the law, look at the problem, make a thoughtful decision, 
and initiate. And if it doesn't work, you monitor and you adjust and you try something else. But you cannot continue to ignore the problem. And what's going on right now at that southern border, to me, looks like somebody's not paying attention. It looks like we're just totally ignoring what's going on. From my point of view, Bob, it looks like we've got an open border right now, period. And I've been to Piedras Negras, and I've been to Del Rio. I drove down there and looked for myself. It is an open border right now. Don't kid yourself. Joe, what else? Yeah, it's 100% an open border, and Kamala Harris is in charge of it and has never been there. So you've been there twice, Bruce, and our own vice president's never been. Um, I think when you, what we're talking about in this room, I think we're looking at immigrants who are coming across the border to work, right? That's what we're looking at. And we do have a system. We have an agricultural visa system. We just don't use it. So there is a system in place to make sure that we're helping migrant workers who want to come across and work and and get in line to become legal citizens of the United States. But when we see 800,000 illegals given in New York, the left is looking at illegals as a, in, in a very different view than what we're talking about here at this around this table. We're talking about a path to citizenship. We're talking about migrant workers who may become seasonally. We're talking about how to get in line and follow the laws of immigration. The only way that we can have a conversation is if we're all, both Democrats and Republicans, are really having an honest, open conversation about what we see with immigrants. Republicans often see them, conservatives, maybe un unaffiliated, as a workforce, right, as a workforce opportunity. What Democrats are proving that they see them as are votes, and that's where the compromise will fall dead because I'm not willing to have a common sense or otherwise conversation <laughs> with a Democrat who thinks 800,000 illegal immigrants that are undocumented in the state of New York should have the right to vote because they should not. Rod Honeycutt, the last word on the issues, Rod. Right, so I wrote down yeah. two words as we were talking about that. One was enforce, enforce the current HB1 and HB2 programs that are in place uh, to make sure that we bring people across the border in a predictable manner for Kirby Johnson and the guys out in Henderson. But it's um, the reform part. I'm willing to reach across the aisle as long as it's one bill, one vote, we debate it on the House floor, and we don't add all this other stuff on top of it that we tend to do. Let's make it simple and stop the omnibus huge bills because we've missed that for years so let's get back to the basics but absolutely we got to get there i think i said it earlier in my opening statement we're acting like it's 1950 and we're in 2022 it's time to move forward all right thanks to each of you we're now going to go to closing statements and wendy navarez we'll start with you So, you know, I have a vested interest here in Western North Carolina because I'm still raising my children here. I want to see them be able to grow up here, be healthy, have a, a job and a house uh, to, to work at and to live in. And so for me, my priorities going into office would be to, um, to bring, some econ bring some of the industry back to the states, not all of it, because, you know, we need, um, you know, lower produced or lower cost uh, produced parts, but also balancing it, just like we do our, our financial portfolios, we have to make sure that we take a balanced approach, approach to industry. So in doing so, um, I want to look at wages. I think that uh, one federal minimum wage is, is outdated. Um, we're not all living on a farm with you know, no electricity or very little, you know, this is, um, 2022 has been noted and, you know, we need internet and all of these other things. And, um, I believe that bringing a, uh, variable minimum wage based on cost of living, um, is extremely important. Um, that way we can drive maybe some of these industries out to rural areas where their larger, uh, payroll ex or their larger expense, which is payroll would be, um, would be cheaper uh, or would be less cost for them. Uh, also working with HUD to improve housing around those facilities. Um, similar, similar, but not exactly. We need to reform it uh, with HUD Section 3 and bringing some tax uh, incentives to those industries so that they will invest 
uh, in the local government, local community and housing. Um, and also making sure that our kids are able to um, have the jobs training, whether it's a community college or high school, making sure they have skills going into the job force at 18 or 20 years old after those programs to be able to do the things uh, that our economy needs, but also teach them to be flexible. Because as we've seen, it's really hard to go to an industry and be there for 20 or 30 years. But when you are able to feel secure in that um, job and in housing and in your wages and really get back to what the, all of that's for, which is to have a, a, a wonderful, uh, healthy, happy family, um, then we, you know, we will see a very um, prosperous future for, our, for ourselves and for our kids. Thank so. you, Wendy Navarez. Next, Bruce O'Connell. This is an important election, folks, and we've all heard there's going to be a red wave. I don't want to get too optimistic because I don't want to jinx it. But let me just suggest that a red wave is not a red wave. In other words, you can elect a Republican, but if it's the same old, same old, Nothing's going to change. I'd like you all to research all of the Republican candidates carefully and look for who offers you a change. Look for someone that's a little bit different. Look for someone that's not a career politician. Look for someone that's maybe doing it for the right reason. Look for someone that's not doing it for a career, doesn't want to be there forever. The trick is, do you have the courage as a voter to do your homework and make the tough decision and not be swayed by the political machine. The political machine out there now is working very hard to convince you who to vote for. They're spending a lot of money. I'm not going to quote the dollars, but some of the career politicians out there are spending close to a half a million dollars already on this campaign. People in this room can't do that. We can put our blood, sweat, and tears into this. We can put our, our savings into it, but we can't compete with the machine. And all I know is I don't want to send anybody back to Congress to represent me that's been there before or that's got anything to do with politics because that's how we got in this mess. You all have to do your homework and then have the courage to make the decision by your vote. Early voting starts April 28th. The election is May the 17th. Not many people vote in a primary. Most people aren't even aware there's a primary. A few votes can make a big difference. Don't let the 1% of the political activists determine who your nominee is going to be. And that's what's going to happen if you don't get off your butts and get out there and vote. Remember, your vote matters more in a primary than it will in the general election. Whoever you nominate in this primary will more than likely be your next congressperson. Don't squander the chance. Demonstrate the courage and get out there and make a difference. My name is Bruce O'Connell, and I'd appreciate you looking into me. If I go, I'll be different, I promise. Thank you, Bruce O'Connell. Next, Michelle Woodhouse. Yeah, I think um, it's been a, it's been great to discuss issues today. Thank you for doing this. This is not something we often get to do. We each usually get about 30 seconds with no rebuttal. So this has been incredible, and I hope that the listeners have enjoyed it because I know I think I can speak for all of us. We really have. But this election is critical because all Republicans are not created equal. And I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do, and then I'm going to tell you what I'm not going to do because you've heard my stance on some of the issues. Here are the things that I will do when I get to Washington, D.C. I will fight to close our border immediately and get it out of the hands of the Mexican drug cartel. I will take us back to the Donald Trump energy dominance policy so we go back to $2 a gallon gas instead of $5 a gallon gas. I will fight to make sure CRT and social emotional learning never see the light of day in any of our classrooms. And I will work to get Dr. Fauci investigated and prosecuted. I will put my name in to serve on the Veterans Affairs and Agricultural Committees because they're the two most important issues on the ground in Western North Carolina. We have more veterans that live in this congressional district than any other in the state, and we agriculture is our number one industry here in Western North Carolina. I will fight for our seniors. We will keep 
Social Security, and Medicare solvent. Our average age in the Republican Party in Western North Carolina is 61. We've got to stand with our seniors. On the ground here, across these 15 counties, a congressional district that's bigger than four states, closer to three state capitals than our own, we will set the standard nationally for constituent services. What that means is whether you live in Cherokee or Yancey and everywhere in between, there will be a constituent services office in your county. We will have constituent service teams that are focused on families, veterans, agriculture, and our law enforcement. To be able to service our constituents in a way that you have the service that you need when you need it. We have all watched our sitting congressman close three of his four offices. As district chair, I took calls on constituent services. When you need help getting navigating the VA, when you need help with your Social Security, when you need a letter to go to West Point, you need to know that your constituent service office is there, and we will staff it primarily with veterans. All will be residents of the 11th Congressional District. What I also pledge to every listener, every voter, that gives me the honor of having their vote, you will never be embarrassed. Never be embarrassed by my behavior. I will take the law seriously. I will not break it. And when you see me on the front page of the Asheville Citizen Times, it will be because I will be the lone vote in the House fighting for the people and the principles of Western North Carolina. I have signed the term limit pledge. I will term out at the most three terms. Um, this is a national pledge that I have signed. And what people of Western North Carolina need to know is that you can pick a member of Congress who will be an America First fighter, who's not using this as a stepping stone for any other political aspirations, but someone who stepped in as a patriot to serve you, and will do that each and every day. My name is Michelle Woodhouse. You can find us at woodhouse4nc.com, and we'd be honored to have your vote and support. Michelle Woodhouse next and last, Colonel Rod Honeycutt. All right, let me echo what Michelle said. Thank you. Uh, it was great to actually have a discussion versus the 30-second soundbite when you sit down, your heart's beating so fast. Did you say the right thing or not? So this was actually great. Uh, but I want the voters of Western North Carolina to realize Rod Honeycutt, born, raised here, first 18 years of my life, schools, churches, fishing holes, deer stands, hay fields, and tobacco fields of Western North Carolina. This is my home. This is my district. I love the men and women of Western North Carolina. I'll go to Washington and work hard every day for every citizen of Western North Carolina. What that means in my opening statement, devotion. I will not walk by mistakes. I will not cover up mistakes. Every day, constituent services open. Every day, not forgetting where I come from. Every day, looking the voters of Western North Carolina in the eye and having a discussion. As I walked around between April and August, as I traveled to 15 counties, I'd go talk to the county commissioners. I'd go talk to the GOP chairs. There's no communications between the district chairs, the county chairs, and Washington, D.C. It was broken. Mm -hmm. I promise you, we'll have flat communications. You will know what I'm doing in Washington, D.C., and I'll know what you're doing in Liberty, North Carolina. We will have an honest discussion. I'm running for men and women of the service. 85,000 veterans in this district. It's been 32 years since we've had a veteran in this seat. 17 of the 21 past representatives had military service. That's important. When you start making decisions on our national treasures, you should have had experience to make that decision. It's about our law enforcement officers. Back in the blue, Funding the police, not defunding the police. Every day, optimizing our great sheriff's department to stop what's coming across our southern border, to help our fire department. We've got firemen here who've worked for 25 years without retirement because we forgot where they come from. And then our students. We've got students here for the last two years who are so far behind, it's going to take us a generation to catch them up. Second graders in Cherokee who can't say their ABCs. Seniors who cannot write a paragraph because we locked them away from school for two years. And I agree, it's about energy dominance. But it's more than just energy dominance. It's energy dominance with security, securing 2.6 million miles of pipeline across the United States that protects us from a cyber attack in the future. It's about voter integrity. 
at the state level. It's about closing a border, but not forgetting we have three other borders that we've got to pay attention to. You've got to have a world mind. You can't just be focused on one topic. I'm proud to have served for 37 years. I'm proud to come home and continue to be a public servant. My name is Rod Honeycutt. I ask you to look it up at rodhoneycuttforcongress.com or give us a call, 828-275-6848. We'll come visit. God bless you, God bless yours, and God bless the United States of America. Rod Honeycutt, and let me just say a special thanks to the four of you for both uh, an engaging and candid conversation and demonstrating that in politics you can disagree, but you can disagree politely and courteously uh, uh, and emphatically, and I thank each of you for making the decision to run for public office. It's not easy. It's hard work. It's a challenge, uh, and we need good people willing to do it, and I would encourage any and all listening. Uh, I had a civics teacher in the ninth grade at Hendersonville High School who said voting wasn't a right. It was a responsibility, and so I encourage everyone, if you're registered in the Republican primary, get out there and vote. Uh, if you're unaffiliated and you want to vote in the Republican primary, you have that option. Uh, and if you're not registered to vote, you've got, I think, a few days left, April right? 22nd. Yeah, so April, April 22nd to <laughs> register to vote. So thank you for listening. Thanks to the folks at WPVM for sponsoring this. And I turn it over to you, Devine, <laughs> at this point. Or do we start playing music? I'm not sure. I... Yeah, just raise up fingers.